logos on this slide, and that's because there are lots of people involved in this program, right? It's not, it's driven by the museum and the mammal section, but really, without all of those other people and the little bits of funding that we get, we really wouldn't be able to do what we can do. And I thank them very much. Okay, so when we want to manage or conserve animals, I guess, and plants, we need to know some pretty basic information. And you will be amazed at how little we know about our whales and dolphins, not just in South Australia, but around the world. And it's because, well, I'll show you in another slide, but um, they're hard to study. Okay, so we need some basic information. So one thing that the museum can do is, at least with the common species, is get enough specimens together to study some of those basic things. So I always like to say there's a what, where, when, and how that we need to know. So what I've done is, under these categories, I've got um, some of, just some examples of what we might want to know. Well, a pretty basic one, and I've underlined what I think are the most important, at least in that list, is what it is. Right? What species is it? And you might say, well, goodness gracious, surely you know that. <laughs> well, we don't know that. Because they are very hard to identify at sea. So if you're studying live animals, it's really tricky. Um, we, don't, we haven't got the total taxonomy all worked out either. So what is a pretty important question when you want to conserve something? Where? Well, there's another little problem, eh? With whales and dolphins, they're not on land where we can trap them and catch them and let them go. They're out there where it's very difficult to study them. So where does it live? That's a pretty important thing. In other words, what is its distribution? Um, when? Well, when does it mature? Because if you're going to look at how many animals, are, or if you're going to look at the future, say in a hundred years or a thousand years of that species, then you need to know how many are added to that population or species. And so you need to know things very basic like when does a female mature, right? So when, what's her maximum capacity for bearing little ones in its life? How? Well, how did it die? How old is it? And how many are in, say, South Australia, or Australia, or around the world? Those things, you might think they're really basic. They are basic, actually. But we don't know a lot of the answers to those, even for the common dolphins, like, say, the bottlenose that you have in the Port River. OK, so why are they difficult to study? So I've said marine mammals here. Really, I guess I mean cetaceans, because at least seals and their relatives come on shore for part of their life cycle, right? So you can count them. And we have one of our honoraries at the museum is Peter Shaughnessy, and he's wonderful at doing his seal work. So that's how they count them. They don't count them when they're out there in the water, when it's really difficult to do it. They count them when they're on land. So they live in this marine environment, which is so totally unknown to us, or not totally unknown, un, um, somewhat unknown to us. And they often live at depths where we can't see them easily. They're usually pelagic. So pelagic means way out in the open ocean. So for those species that come in close to the shore, like right whales and humpback whales, they're not too bad, because at least for part of their life cycle, they're close to shore. And we can either get out in a plane and count them, or stand on the cliff and count them. But for the ones that never come in to shore except maybe to die, well, we're pretty restricted in our sample sizes. And this is the real bugbear here, especially for <laughs> museum collections, because they're large. They're hard to take apart. They're expensive. They're um, time-consuming to get the samples from those animals because they are so big. So for example, we had in October a blue whale. This was a juvenile pygmy blue whale and it was 15 meters long. Well, trying to deal with that on the beach is kind of tricky. Um, so, yeah, the other thing, which I shouldn't have really put in small letters down here, is this says, needs speci specialist knowledge. <laughs> And I'm not, I'm not being silly, actually, no, I'm giggling. Um, many areas of science now require very specialist knowledge. And it's kind of tricky because people read a lot on the internet and sort of think that they know a lot. And yes, they obviously are knowing more than they might have 20 years ago. But 
just even identifying some of these specimens requires, and I'm looking at Sue here again because she will know her plant, <laughs> from the plants. Um, it's really quite tricky and many times we'll have a specimen come up on the shore and I won't say what it is. I'll say I think it might be, but I need to look at the skull or I need to have the genetics done or whatever to say the basic thing like, um, what is it? What species is it? So, what can the South Australian Museum do to help conserve whales and dolphins? It's a bit odd, isn't it? Because we study dead things mostly. <laughs> And I always tell people, well, studying dead things can help conserve live ones. Well, why do you think that might be? Why do you think it's interesting or good to study dead things and not live ones? They don't run away. That's right. And we can get right inside there so we can learn more about their diseases, about their cause of death, about their reproductive history, all of those things. So really, I guess the upshot is the best thing is to study the live ones and the dead ones and put the information together. I mean, I'm not saying that only studying dead ones is a good thing, but you know it's just harder to do. So, so one of the things that the museum can, the reason why we can do some of these things is because we've got amazing facilities, and I'll show you some slides in a sec. We've got wonderful collections. And our collections are actually for marine mammals, not just whales and dolphins, is above 2,200 2, now. Um, and it is the biggest and sort of most comprehensive in Australia. And we do some interesting research on those specimens and the information. And it's not just us, it's often groups of people. Uh, there is a South Australian Museum Act in 1976 so that's why the little asterisk on there. So we have a responsibility to keep those collections in good order and the information and the collections accessible to anybody around the world who wants to study those. It doesn't, the act though doesn't force us, or require us I should say, to collect more, but I just can't help myself. <laughs> because, because I see these opportunities and for example, so for bottlenose dolphins, we now have well over 300 specimens. And for common dolphins, we have um, well over 300 specimens as well. So my boss once said to me, Kath, are you sure you need another dolphin? <laughs> and I said, yes, I do need another dolphin, Chris, because with the common animals, that's where you get the good science. Because you're looking at all the variability. If you've just got rare things, yeah, it's fun, it's interesting, but you're not necessarily doing the really good science on them. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, the facilities that we have, and we are so lucky to have these. I came to the museum in 1983. I was a small mammal person. I didn't know hardly anything about marine mammals. And we had this facility only just built, actually, in 1981-82, which is called Bolivar. We need to rename it. <laughs> Because, because Bolivar is associated with the sewage works. And I don't jest actually, they actually they put the museum out there at Bolivar in the 60s because they both stank, really. <laughs> Keep the two stinky things together. But we didn't have this wonderful preparation building then. It wasn't until about 1982, just before I came to the museum. So really I had, you know, I had it made kind of, <laughs> to, to make the change to marine mammals. This building here wasn't built until about 96. So this is where the collection items are stored. So basically we do our dissections and our preparation of the skeletons and everything else here in this building. And then next door is another building where we have all of the um, specimens, basically mostly the skeletons, but there's a few other things too. We also have a, a big freezer. This is a walk-in freezer where we store a lot of the larger specimens. So if you don't have these facilities, it's harder to do the work, right? So we have gantry cranes that can lift the heavy stuff. It just makes it easier. So we're very fortunate. The other facility that we have, a major one, I feel like, is we have a lab in the basement of our science center where we do tooth aging, or we do aging, and mostly we're using teeth. Age is a really important bit of information when we're looking at many parts of an animal's biology. And to get the age of an animal, 
we have a well, dolphin, that is. Okay, so we're dealing with teeth that are maybe about this big. We do various processes and we end up with a section, a thin section that's about 25 micrometers that is stained and put on a slide. Can you see there, although it's a bit, this one's easy to see, so that's what's called the neonatal line. So that line is laid down at about the time of birth. And although it's not quite so obvious, there are other lines in there. So this animal's probably about three or four years old. Um, it's really, I don't really need you to see the lines, you just have to believe me that they're there. <laughs> and they are counted. Uh, many times and through several teeth in one individual in order to arrive at an age. It's an estimate of the number of years old that an animal is. <coughs> to give you an example of how we use this information, this is one of my studies on male sexual maturity. So we've taken body length down here, estimated age along here, and we've graphed those figures. So then I could say for South Australian <coughs> bottlenose dolphins, the males are mature at about 11 years old. So this is the gap in here. So the, the yellow ones are immature. Please ignore these two because they're a bit aberrant. And the blue um, diamonds are mature animals. Does that make sense? So that's a facility that we have that people in Australia don't have. So we're kind of the national aging facility. I hate to use, I hate to make it sound as if we're the biggest and the best. I suppose we are in a way, but you know, it sounds a bit sort of arrogant, doesn't it? Okay, so, but I can quite clearly say that we are the largest, because I know the other numbers, and I say most comprehensive. Now, what do I mean by that? Do you know what I mean? I have most species. Yes, we probably do. But the interesting thing is, we have all these specimens, and associated with them isn't just the skeleton and the skull. So that's sort of traditional museum fare, is the skulls and the skeletons, right, that you see. So we've collected from a body all these other things, skull, stomach contents, genetic samples, photos, the list goes on and on. So that makes it comprehensive, because for each individual, we have all of this interesting information that can be used in many, many ways. Um, the toxicology ones, actually, this is an interesting one, because we've just recently started to collaborate with a toxicologist from Queensland. And she, she like her eyes were <laughs> just like, ah, I couldn't believe. She said, this is a gold mine, because we not only have all of the tissues, we have all of this other information that goes with it. So hopefully, she's going to be using our collection quite a lot. Um, and we even have specimens where we've just got, we haven't got a body that's come in, we've dug up, or had dug, and dug up for us, some bones. In this case, this is a 2,000 year old sperm whale skull. Now, you guys are geographical society people, so you know about the changing of the, the um, uh, sea levels. So this was Parham, uh, no this wasn't Parham, this was Port, Port Goller and it was about 700 meters or so inland, and it was buried in the shell grit. And through a series of processes and information and working with others, we concluded that this was a sperm whale that had stranded along with others about 2,000 years ago. So it was probably a mass stranding, we'll never know for sure. So that's where we can use all this other information of, you know, the, the stratigraphy, the stratigraphy, and there was a, underneath this there was a, God. Um, what's it called? Uh, a storm surge, so you had different types of um, sediment. See, I'm, obviously, this is not my area, so I relied on other people to tell me this. That, that's what we assumed, that, that this was 2,000 years old or so. Um, the other thing that our museum has that many other museums don't have very many of is large specimens. So why? Why, apart from me being <laughs> fanatical about getting everything we can, um, why is it easier for us to get large specimens? You've seen our facilities. We can, we can prepare them because we have these huge vats and the gantry cranes and a wonderful volunteer team that can get out there. So this is a fin whale, Port Parham. Do you remember this? Uh, what is this? Eight years ago? So this was a juvenile fin whale that we collected. This was 
uh, a sperm whale, this is an adult male <coughs> sperm whale, there's a huge difference between adult males and adult females. But there are two examples really of how we can go about collecting these very large things, um, whereas other museums have trouble. What that one died? You said it was Which one? This one here? Yeah, I suspect it was hit by a boat, but I can't be absolutely sure. There was some pretty major hemorrhaging in the right sort of areas. Yeah. Uh, fin whales don't live in the gulfs, so fin whales are things that live way out there in the open ocean. It may have been hit, if it was hit, it may have been hit somewhere, say, Kangaroo Island or off there, and then well, not died immediately, um, come in for shelter, and then died in the gulfs. It was pretty fresh. You can see from that, that's, that's a pretty fresh animal. <coughs> we do all kinds of states of decomposition. <laughs> and I'm always telling people, of course, they've got skeletons, don't they? The skeletons aren't going to rot, and you can still <laughs> learn really good things from the skeletons. The other thing that we have, which is not specimen related in terms of skulls, genetic tissues, etc., but we call it a collection, is our database and images of sightings of whales and dolphins. So this is a bit unusual for a museum to do this. And the reason I guess I took it on was because it seemed there was no one else in South Australia who was prepared to do it, I guess who had the knowledge to identify things, and also had the long-term view that a museum has about keeping specimens and records. So we took it on maybe 25 years ago, and we're now up to about um, 5,000 records. Not all of the records have um, photos, but obviously, if we've got a photo, that's fantastic, because we can identify, usually, the species. Sometimes it's just information that we're given. So we are really the South Australian whale and dolphin database. So we do it on behalf of the Department for Environment. Yeah, so blue whales do occur in South Australia, especially between November and May. They come into the body upwelling off the southeast coast. They also could be in the boat. So there's a fair bit of research being done on them now. So if you combine the information from, that you get from the spe specimens, so in this case, these green dots, oh, you probably can't see the green, but these, the green dots are the ones along the shore. So they're the strandings and the carcasses. If you combine that information with the sightings of live animals, alive and well, that people have seen, then it's really quite powerful. So if you used one set of data and not the other, you might not get the full picture of its distribution. Whereas if you combine them, it's much better. So, the last section of the talk is about the research that we do at the museum. And we do so many different kinds of things, our group of people that I, there's no way I can cover all. Um, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about taxonomy about distribution and abundance, and about pathology. So I've got some examples. So taxonomy, what is taxonomy? It's basically naming and describing and identifying species. So as an example, we've been doing some work on bottlenose dolphins. There are two species of bottlenose dolphins recognized in the world. Both occur in, South, both occur in Australia. And we need to know, first of all, are there two that occur, occur all around Australia? Are they in South Australia? And how do you tell them apart? So these are some photos here of the Indo-Pacific and the common bottlenose dolphin. So we kind of have to go working backwards in order to work out if both of them are here and how we tell them apart. So what we do is we do <coughs> measurements of usually the skull, sometimes other parts of the skeleton. And we put those measurements into a multivariate analysis of some sort, and we come up with trees. So this is a, a dendrogram. So this tree here says that these animals here are similar. This tree here, these animals are similar. So each branch on the end, that's one specimen. So there were about 80 specimens in this study. So that tells us that probably, based on morphology anyway, that this one here is one species, and this is another species. So then what we do, if we want to identify 
live animals or dead animals that we have the whole body of, we take those identifications from the skulls, we go backwards, and we work out that because we have lots of photographs from various angles of these animals that were the skulls in the previous slide, and we worked out that this is the general color pattern of the common bottlenose dolphin, and this is the general color pattern of the Indo-Pacific bottlenose dolphin. And that's how we can help conserve them, because that will help tell people who are out there, or who see a dead animal on the beach, what species it is. Does that make any sense? You sometimes have to go in a sort of con um, convoluted way in order to get the answer that you want. And it takes time. <laughs> And it takes a lot of animals. So really, some of this is 30 years of work on and off. And out of that taxonomy or identifying species or knowing what species are in South Australia, we and the Department for Environment hold kind of the official list of um, the vertebrates of South Australia. In this case, they're the whales and dolphins. So if you are interested, and there is also maps of where those have been found in South Australia, you just do Census of South Australian Vertebrates, it'll take you to the Department for Environment's website, and you can look at maps and see what the official list is for, this, for the state. And we have 33 whales and dolphins. Does that surprise people? Yeah. But obviously, not all of them live here all the time. Some of them are just vagrants from you know, passing through, or they might be migratory, whatever. But 33 have been recorded. 10 of those are baleen whales, and 23 are toothed whales, dolphins, and one porpoise, which was a, a vagrant. <coughs> so can you see that the usefulness of, um, I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to do is say, sometimes, well, often, science is looking at a particular thing, but it can have an application to a broader, um, plan, I guess, in this case, conservation. So if we look at distribution and abundance, okay, so last year, do you remember that there was a court case that involved um, some tuna, um, uh, a company, Oceanic Victor, that wanted to put a tuna cage with wild, with not wild tuna, with tuna in it and other native fishes, or Victor Harbor? <laughs> Okay, so that all went through and it was approved and there was a challenge to it. So I was asked by the challengers to provide some more information because when they did the initial approval, there was hardly anything, almost nothing actually, on the whales and dolphins in the Victor area. So I got together and I, I got all our records out and I did some summaries. So I thought you might like to see these. So we're dealing here with the southern right whale. I'm sure you've seen southern right whales. Everybody's seen a southern right whale? Yes. And humpback whale, humpback whale. Who, who is surprised to hear that we have humpback whales in South Australia? Yeah, we do. And they're becoming more and more seen because as their numbers are increasing about 10 or 11% per year on the, in their major populations are the east and west coast of Australia, we're going to see more because there's no whaling. You see, they're... That was the major threat to them. Okay, so what I did was, I, I wanted to do two things. I couldn't, couldn't work out how many were there because that requires very rigorous, expensive surveys and over a long period of time. But what I could do was look at the records over time and I could look at where they were found. So, southern right whales in Encounter Bay, these little bright green dots are where they have been seen. Now obviously they're biased towards the coast because that's where people see them, right? That's observer effort bias. But at least it tells us that they can be seen all along this big area called Encounter Bay. So then we focused in on the area, this is Grand Island. This is where the tuna farm it actually is there now. <laughs> so they've towed it there. Um, we wanted to know how, how the past records um, show the distribution, what was it in that area? Because they hadn't mentioned anything about right whales being close to where they proposed to put this thing. And you can see that these pink and green dots are pretty close. So up here, let's go to humpback whales. So we did the same thing for humpback whales. We plotted their distribution. So not many of them seen in here, 
probably what they're doing is they're coming like this. They're, they're out to sea a bit more and they're coming around Newland Head. So what, how, we do, how do we do the abundance thing if we haven't got surveys, right? So we've got a problem. So we've got year along here. This is Southern Right Wells, Pump Out Wells. Year along the bottom, starting with 1970, going to 2013, and in the case of humpbacks, 1984 to 2013. So the blue bars are simply numbers of sightings. And of course, you can see the same whale several times, and you're going to be biasing your records, right? So I have to be careful that I know I do. So this could be just observer interest. So what we did was, with the red line, we plotted the maximum number of whales seen on any, sorry, the day on which the maximum number of whales were seen in Victor Harbor. So in other words, at one time, five whales were seen, or whatever it was on here. Sorry, the scale's not great. This is a maximum of 25 up here. So we think the red line is probably more indicative that whales, southern right whales, are increasing, at least in their visits to Victor Harbor. So we needed to know that in order to say to the developers, look, you're risking something here because they are here and they're going to go up. And the longer that that tuna cage is going to be there, there'll be the chance of a problem. Humpback whales are a bit trickier because they're lower numbers and because in about 2010 or so, Elizabeth started <laughs> To really, to really look at them, right? So this could be biased by her samples. So, what are the risks? Many. But one of the big ones, or two of the big ones, is entanglement. This is a southern right whale entangled, so you can see those ropes around it? In Spencer Gulf, Upper Spencer Gulf, in crab pots in 1992. Fortunately, the whale got the ropes off. I think somebody got in there with it and cut them off. <laughs> Very dangerous thing to do, but anyway, the whale, the whale was fine, lived as far as we know. This other, this is a humpback whale that is actually in a tuna pen uh, around Port Lincoln in 1993. So of course I presented this to the court, saying, well, I can't say whether this is going to happen in Victor Harbor, but here are your chances. We know it can happen, and so you need to take this into account. So what they did was, I did definitely stir them up a bit. <laughs> Um, they changed the design of their moorings so that the long, loose ropes wouldn't be so many. Okay, so we didn't stop the development, but at least we've got them to change <laughs> the ways that they're doing things. And I think that's one of my jobs, is to use the information that we have. It's not necessarily that I'm saying don't do it, but I'm saying here are the risks, then you decide. If you don't give people the information, then they're not going to know the risks. The last example was something a bit different from what museums normally do. We are very fortunate to have with us Ikuko Tomo, who is a, trained in Japan. She's a veterinary pathologist, and she works in our team. So she is one of these veterinary pathologists here. So you, I think you can see that one of the good things about a group studying uh, whatever they're studying, is that you've got all these different expertises and you bring them together and, and it's much more powerful than just one or two people. So, do you remember that in 2013, which is now four years ago, that lots of dolphins died in Gulf St. Vincent? Do you remember that? It was in the news a fair bit. And, of course, we didn't really know why. It took us actually a year or so to work out why and then another year or two to publish the paper on it. So, what happened was, and this is, I have to make a plug for our wonderful long-term records. So, um, the long-term records, I so say this is years from 1990 through to 2014. So, what do you get from this? What's, what's the advantage of long-term records? You can see the trend, and you can see when something is really unusual. Otherwise, we would have, if we didn't have this data, we'd just be saying, oh, you know, well, there was five last year and two the year before and whatever. But when you give them a graph like this, they say, oh, yes, I think there's something wrong here. And most of them were bottlenose dolphins, okay? The little stripy one is the common dolphin. So it was, whatever it was, was mostly affecting bottlenose. And when we looked at the different age classes here, so this is from very young through to adult, we looked at three time periods. So 
sorry, I should say what a UME is, is an unusual mortality event, regardless of the cause. So before the event, which was from March to September, October, before the event, we had this spread of age classes. Then, in the early part of the UME, we had lots and lots of younger animals. So whatever it was, was affecting young animals more than older animals. So that's a little bit of a clue to us when we started looking at why. And then later on, we were getting more adults as the UME progressed. So it, was only, it only happened for about um, seven months. So what the pathologists did was they, we, we did gross pathology, we did follow-up histopathology, etc. And the, the basic thing was, well, there were lots of things wrong with the animals, but the two most obvious ones to us were this severe hemorrhaging. You see all this red here? We don't know what causes it, actually. We know that it was part of the UME, but we don't know why. And the brains were congested and there were lots of other um, indicators. But the really nice clincher was the immunohistochemistry, where the CSIRO Animal Health Lab, there were two scientists from there in Geelong, um, looked at these samples and they worked out that these, these reddy brown um, substances on here are viral an antigen in lung tissue. So they have to go through a whole very complicated and specialized process to show that. So that told us then that it was, whoops, <laughs> Morbillivirus. So there's several kinds of morbillivirus. It's related to measles in humans and distemper in dogs and rundapest. Rundapest, that's um, in ungulates, I think. So it's a related, it's in the, um, it's not always in the same genus, but at least the cetacean ones, there's several different varieties. Um, so I like to tell people about our pathology work because it is quite different for a museum to be involved in this. But you can imagine the opportunities are fantastic because we have all those bits and pieces from those animals. So it's, it's pretty good and we're lucky to have it go. So is considering cetaceans a challenge? Yes from lots of points of view. Not only are they being <coughs> expensive to get to, actually one thing I didn't mention was the other problem with the large, the really large animals is that when you get to it, first of all it takes you a day or two to get there because there's huge logistic problems. And then you have to get inside <coughs> the animal in order to get at the organs quite quickly. If you don't do that, you've got decomposing organs. So. And it's often, say, three days sometimes, two or three days before we actually get in there. So it's harder to look at the disease processes because they've already started to decompose inside. So logistically, they're very difficult. And the last thing I want to point out, and I'm, I'm not in any way advocating that we should go <laughs> this way, but marine mammals are treated very differently from all other mammals in that we are not allowed to go out and collect them. Okay, that sounds abhorrent to some of you, but the trouble is with what we are studying now is maybe an abnormal part of the population because they're the ones that are diseased, stranded, etc. So that makes it harder for us to actually get the real information on the healthy population. And as I say, I'm not advocating, and we would never go down that route anyway, but it, it, does, it is a challenge. Um, to get really good information. So thank, thank you to all of the people who help us, and this is only some of them. <coughs> but again, you can see that we, we have fun. <laughs> it's not a trial for us to do what we do, so we're pretty lucky. Thank you. Thank you.